Welcome to Ethical Frontiers in Biotechnology. I'm Christine Mitchell, the Executive Director of the Center for Bioethics. Those of you who have been coming every month will know that our Center Director, Bob Trug, often does this introduction. As some of you may not know, he is both a practicing critical care pediat pediatrician um, and he is actually on service, saving lives tonight in the ICU at Children's Hospital, so I'm filling in. We are very pleased to see both familiar and new faces tonight when we first talked about this monthly series of um, opportunities to talk about novel um, bioscience and biomedical engineering and look at some of the ethical challenges that they raise. We very much wanted to build a new community of people in conversation with one another, bioscientists, biomedical engineers, people in the labs as well as in our affiliated clinical facilities and the public in conversation with ethicists. And so In Su Hyun, who has coordinated this series, um, has been very successful at doing that and bringing in some of the people to tell us about the latest biotechnology. Well, thank you, Christine, for that introduction. And I really do welcome you to the um, Biotechnology and Future of Medicine Conference. I think it's going to be an exciting meeting next month. So I would like to take this time to introduce our special guest, Dr. Jingping Fu from the University of Michigan. Um, he is Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering, Associate Professor of Biomedical Engineering, and Associate Professor of Cell and Developmental Biology. He's the Associate Director of the Michigan Center for Integrative Research and Critical Care. He received his PhD at MIT in Mechanical Engineering, and it's really exciting um, to have him here as a speaker because he brings a fresh perspective for stem cell biology as a mechanical engineer. I'll become very clear to you during his presentation today, just what is the mechanical engineer's mindset when they approach uh, vexing issues and problems in um, stem cell based modeling. And you'll see his innovative approach to resolving some of these problems with consistency that he'll note in his portion of the talk. Um, I just flew in from Barcelona from a very, uh, very impressive um, bioengineering meeting. And let me tell you, his work is just the talk of the town internationally. Uh, it's, he was really being uh, quite rightfully praised as an enormously useful innovator in the space of embryo modeling. And not only that, scientifically speaking, but as an extremely thoughtful, carefully minded uh, research scientist on top of his innovative science. So uh, I'm very pleased to have him here today. He's, he's really in the entire Ethical Frontier series, our only guest we've flown in from out of state, and it's well worth it to have him here. Um, so as you all know how this works, we're going to first start with, um, first start with some presentation from us. And then we will uh, transition over to a discussion with you, the audience. So expect, you know, just under an hour of um, presentation and about half an hour of discussion with you. And we really do invite you to, to give us your thoughts and your feedback. So as we're presenting, as questions start to arise in your minds, please jot them down so you don't forget. And then engage in discussion and conversation with all of us afterwards. So. Uh, the topic for today is embryo modeling and embryo cultivation. This is a rapidly moving area in scientific research and in bioethics. This whole uh, new field of embryo modeling is, uh, is quite, quite remarkable, very rapidly moving, but also stirs up some very complex questions about ethics and policy for this area. So we'll get into all these issues. Um, one of the immediate issues that comes up, and it even came up in the way in which I thought, how would I advertise this talk? Like, what title do I use? Because there really is a big question to mark about what we call these entities. They're so new, any term you use is going to be suboptimal from some point of view. One idea is to call these things gastroloids, to kind of you know, mimic the, the figure of speech that people have been using for organoids, which are self-assembling, self-organizing stem cell-based models of particular organs. Maybe we might use the word gastroloid to, to represent the stage of development that many of these models represent, which would be gastrolation. 
But that's really not the best term to use because the public's going to say, what the heck is a gastroloid? And, uh, and also the models, as you'll see, span a range of developmental timing, which doesn't necessarily always have to do with the gastrulation stage of the developing human embryo. Well, maybe we can just call these synthetic embryos. And in fact, this is the term that I think a lot of the press has jumped on. Um, this is, again, probably not optimal for ethics and, and public messaging because synthetic tends to be somewhat of a bad, a bad label to call something. And it, again, may not be all that accurate in, uh, in terminology for describing this kind of work because these are made of real cells, real human cells that really do dynamically self-organize in these unique ways. So there's some question about just really how synthetic are these things. Um, this is probably the best term to use, but it's very cumbersome. <laughs> Stem cell-based models of early human development. Uh, we know that if we use this term in talking with the press, they're just going to call these something else. I mean, this just takes up too, many, too, many, too much space in the, uh, in the newspaper column. So I think if you throw this out, they'll just shorten it to embryo models. So with that in mind, I thought, well, we'll just call this embryo modeling for now. TBA, what they're actually going to be called in the future. One of my favorite terms, though, uh, what these have been called in the past, were souls. <laughs> souls. Self-organizing embryo-like structures. Now, Jean-Tin, I don't know if George Church came up with this, but I also like the idea of George Church's souls. <laughs> but, um, but this is problematic. Um, uh, just, just, it rolls off the tongue, but it also makes your heart beat a little faster. Um, and this work is really not that old in terms of science. Uh, 2014 was the first major paper which described this phenomenon. This was um, from the lab of Ali Brivenloo, who, by the way, is one of the speakers at our uh, conference coming up. Not only this time he'll be talking about um, chimera research, human animal chimera research, because he does that too. But from the Brivenloo lab at Rockefeller University, headed up by Aria Warmflat, is known as the warm flash paper. All these great names, great labels, right? The warm flash paper um, described this phenomena, which was really pretty remarkable. All they did was they used micro-patterned culture discs. So these are basically uh, culture systems which on the bottom of the, of the plastic dish, they had these little stippled little bumps that make the cells stay in a particular pattern. What they realized, what they found out was, if you get circles in a particular diameter and you put human embryonic stem cells on them or human iPS cells, these are stem cells that are derived from skin cells to mimic embryonic stem cells, whatever cell line they use, in just a matter of a couple of days, it forms this self-organized pattern. Well, what's going on here? You have, if you test the cell types, you have on the outer layer the, uh, uh, the endoderm, metal, the next layer in, mesoderm cell lineage, very center, um, endoderm. No, 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 no. Endoderm is on the outside. Ectoderm is in the middle. So endo, meso, ecto. Um, it's just one. It's two dimensional, so it's basically like one cell layer thick. Uh, but they also have they describe what seem to be emerging primitive streak-like regions. So these terms will be a little bit more apparent of what we mean by them as we go along in the discussion today. But just know. All three germ layers of the developing embryo seem to be represented in this self-organizing structure, and there may be the appearance of a raised primitive streak-like area. So the primitive streak is also going to come into play in our discussion. So that's pretty remarkable, because human embryonic stem cells and human iPS cells are known to be identical. They're just identical in type. You really can't distinguish one from another, but when you put them in close contact with one another, where they can touch one another, and they're forced to remain in this tight circle, give it a little bone growth factor, just a little bit of a nudge forward, and then they, they emerge in this pattern. So that's really quite remarkable. Now we're getting ever more look-alike models, this time in the mouse. One of this is a real mouse embryo, and the other one is a mouse embryo model. Right. Do you know which one's which? Jingping, do you know which one's which? The one on the right is the model. The one on the left is the real thing. Remarkable, right? So at what point does a model become the real thing? Can your model get so good, so complete, that really functionally you made an embryo? Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Fu, and he'll lead us through um, some of his work in working on these kinds of entities. Let me exit out of here.
and then we'll tag team like we always do. Uh, thanks, Ingsu. Uh, thank you uh, for the kind introduction, and also it's a great pleasure for me to be here. And uh, so, as a scientist, in fact, uh, uh, we over the last few years, I think my group has, I guess, entered into this exciting emerging area. And people over time realize that the human stem cells, in particular, human propotent stem cells, including both human embryonic stem cells and induced propotent stem cells, really retain some amazing self-organizing properties and developmental potential. Somehow, when you add them, like play them into suitable three-dimensional cultural environment, or maybe even two-dimensional cultural environment, and they start to self-organize, as Insu mentioned, from one fresh paper, and on two-dimensional surfaces, they pattern into a multicellular structures, somehow given signatures consistent or compatible, suggesting that there's some embryonic developmental events happening in, in the culture. So somehow, we in fact, this is a slide summarizing the existing models have been reported uh, from my group as well as from many others. And you can see that on the left hand side, that's uh, basically the sectional images showing that the human embryo and right after implantation and over time from implantation towards gastration and the next step is neuration. And neuration is basically the the central nerve system, the precursor of the central nerve system, I'm talking about the neural tube, will develop from the ectoderm layer after gastrulation. So you can see that, in fact, uh, oh, I think I will just use the mouse, and uh, this is the blastocyst containing the apiblast, and then afterwards there's a cavity formation. This is what we call amniotic cavity, the symmetry breaking containing a bipolar tissue. And afterwards, that's gastrulation. Let's take a look. That's the gastrulation. You can see the cells start to enter and beneath the space between the epiblast and the underlying what we call hypoblast. And soon after, I guess I don't need to provide the details, but afterwards, one of the germ layer, the ectoderm, was, was start to, I would say, pattern and develop into a neural tube. You can see the neural tube here now. So more or less, over the last, I would say, about 10 years now, less than 10 years, and different groups, including ours, and we have developed using human proponent stem cells, again, both embryonic stem cells and induced proponent stem cells, to develop models that allow us to model different events, different developmental events, and present it on these slides, and early human embryonic developmental events. And some of the developmental events, in fact, might not be on a single isolated event from these models. In fact, I'll present some models from my group. You will see that it's a continuous developmental process and showing a very interesting, I would say, morphogenetic dynamics mimicking a continuous uh, embryo developmental events. OK, so how we get started? And before I present some of the, the real experimental data, and uh, I, I will provide some more information about human embryo development after the human embryo implant into the maternal uterus. And you can think about this is the this is the human embryo, and uh, this is what we call blastocyst, and containing the prepotent epiblast. The epiblast are the prepotent stem cells. Eventually, will differentiate, and uh, will we'll form all the, the cell types in the human fetus. And after implantation, soon after implantation, you can see that the, somehow the cells, the epiblast cells, they will start to organize themselves and open a cavity spontaneously. This is what we call proamionic cavity. And soon after, you see some very interesting what we call symmetry breaking events where the cells here next to the invading trophoblast, they start to differentiate into what we call amionic ectoderm. These are the precursor cells eventually, over time, they will differentiate into amnion. That's the extra embryonic membrane enclosing the developing feeders. And then the cells remaining here next to the hypoblast, they remain prepotent. But soon after, in fact, you can see that there's another symmetry breaking events where the cells, the epiblast, as the prospective posterior end, they, was they, was, they will continue to develop and they undergo gastrulation and they will develop into, for example, mesoderm. I should also point out post implantation, but before the onset of gastrulation, there's a very important cell type, it's what we call primordial germ cell. These are the precursor cells for sex cells and uh, Somehow, I guess in mammalian development, including human, monkey, and uh, uh, mice as well, in fact, primordial germ cells, they will, in, they will appear, and in fact, post-implantation, but before gastrulation, in the embryonic structure. So again, these are the sectional images showing co corresponding stages of the human embryo. 
and you can see the very clear symmetry breaking here. This is the amionic ectoderm, and enclosing what we call the proamionic cavity here, and this is the columnar epiblast. And the reason I pointed out, because this asymmetrical tissue structure, I think we, as you can see from my, uh, what I'm going to present, we, we, this is a, almost an embryonic structure feature that uh, very distinct and very important and to validate, I guess, to confirm the validity of our models. So this is, has been a very surprising journey for us. And when we started this project, we wasn't thinking about using human proponent stem cells to model human development. And more or less, we were excited about the existing organoid research and where people are using human proponent stem cells in jack land, play land into three-dimensional cultures, and they were developed into organ rudiments. So in one of the control experiments in our 3D culture, and where we don't add any exogenous external soluble factors to drive them to differentiate. So we don't have those soluble factors. So in our control experiments, somehow the students start to see some amazing self-organizing events, and somehow the embryonic stem cells, they, they form commonly, they start to talk to each other, and they start to organize themselves and into, I would say, patterned structures and bear some significant similarities to developing embryo. So let me go through the videos with you. In fact, the top video here is going to replay, and so it's going to replay soon. And you can see the cartoon here, more or less summarizing what is happening. Now it's placed. You can see originally, originally is a cluster of cells forming a colony, but soon after you can see it forms a cavity spontaneously without any exogenous external input from, from us. But soon after, you can see that the cells start to look somewhat different. You can see they become squamous, flattened, right? And uh, you start to see extend, extensive protrusions extended from the basal surfaces. So we did some, quite some, we performed quite some molecular characterization to determine, we understand this, uh, these are the cells differentiating from human proponent stem cells because the morphology looks very different. And when we stain the cells for prepotency markers, these are the markers associated with prepotency, and we see these markers are gone. For example, here, nanog, which is a key marker for prepotent stem cells. You can see that the marker, the nanog, is now expressed in the nucleus of the cells. And it took us a while. And at the end, we realized that the differentiating cells, where they are forming the cavity, these are the cells, these are the red cells after differentiation. Then we go back to the cartoon. It turns out the differentiating cells forming the cavity these are the amniotic ectoderm cells, spontaneously differentiating within the three-dimensional colony. But of course, in the first example here, all the cells eventually will differentiate, and they form this uniform, what we call squamous amniotic ectoderm cyst, right? Uniform cyst containing all the cells as amniotic ectoderms. But somehow, in a subset of these cell colonies, we start to see additional phenotype. The cell colonies, they were organized, but at the same time, they develop into different structures. Let's take a very careful look. They form a cavity, just consistent with the previous video. But soon after, you can see that somehow only a portion of the cells initiate the cell shape change. They are differentiating. That's this portion. And you can see that more or less the differentiation will propagate and will propagate from the initial site. And then there's symmetry breaking, forming this bipolar, what we call bipolar, uh, bipolar tissue. And you can see now very clear and uh, morphology, distinct morphology difference and between two compartments of the, the structure. And when we stain the cells, it turns out the, the columnar cells, and basically these cells, they retain expression for prepotency markers. These are undifferentiated prepotent cells. Well, the, only the differentiated cells, that's basically the cells here, the red cells, they will express markers associated with the amine ectoderm as we identified in the first example here. But let's watch the video here. I think it's going to replay soon. And in fact, we start to, if we look more carefully, we see additional phenotypes suggesting continuous progressive development in the same culture and from different subset of cysts. It's the cell colonies. You, now you see symmetry breaking. The cells here differentiating, right, and uh, forming this bipolar asymmetrical structure. But what is most interesting is happening here. You can start to see that the cells start to almost disseminate. They migrate out 
from this compartment, this pole of the structure. And again, this is the cartoon summarizing what you, you observe here. There's symmetry breaking, and you, soon after, the cells here, they start to migrate out, disseminate. In fact, when we stain the cells for markers associated with gastrulation, you can see Barturi, snail, and these are canonical markers associated with gastrulation. And you see this gastrulate, this cells, disseminating cells, they will express gastrulation markers, suggesting these are gastrulating cells. Going back, in fact, again, I want to call this, like really bring, bring you back to what really happens in the human embryo. And in fact, I think what we have been able to model using this is very simple three-dimensional culture environment without any exogenous, I would say, external user input, is you can see we are forming, the cells will form a cavity, and soon after, they break symmetry. And at some point, the cells will disseminate. And from one compartment of the, 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 the cellular structure, so more or less, we, we, we published the paper, people realized that from this, uh, the early publications, I, I guess for the first time, people realized that indeed, uh, even under three-dimensional culture environment using human prepotent stem cells. And this prepotent stem cells can allow us to model certain events associated with human development. Not necessarily, we're not necessarily modeling the entire human embryo, but at least a, the core of the implanting human embryo, I'm talking about the prepotent epiblast, I think just using human prepotent stem cells that allow us to study their dynamics, the developmental, continuous developmental events. So in fact, so the previous example I talked about, we, we were using what I called a conventional three-dimensional culture environment. You, you, load, you see the cells in a 3D, 3D gel, and uh, but more or less, it, it, you see the cells in a random fashion, and the cells will start forming initial cell clusters, colonies, in a random fashion. And that leads to a lot of heterogeneity, even from the single, the same experiment. So you can see that this is the real picture here, showing a real example, experimental data from a single experiment. You can see how heterogeneous it, it is from, from our experiment. Of course, this is the, what we like to see, and really you can see very clear, distinct asymmetrical, asymmetric structure, right? The differentiated squamous tissue here, and the, this might be the, the gastrulating cells, and before the cells start to disseminate, migrating out from the the epiblast-like compartment. But the other tissues here, you can see this is more or less uniformly squamous. The cells should appear to be uniform, where, where here you can see some cells might have not differentiated, while others have been differentiating. But there's significant heterogeneity. And I would also say that, in fact, conventional three-dimensional culture environment has significant lim limitation in reproducibility as well. So, as Insu mentioned, we have a very strong engineering background. We are mechanical engineers, and we, are, we know how to build things. Otherwise, we can bring additional tools, and in this case, microfluidic systems. And by using microfluidic devices, now we, I would say, we have a much more controllable system now and to, to, to generate such embryo-like structures and, uh, I would say, stem cell models. So the microfluidic device is, uh, I can explain very quickly, and. Uh, so this is the top view of the microfluidic device and contain a center channel. This is what we call gel channel. And then the top and bottom channels are remain open and for us to load the cells and also adding external chemical signals. So the cells, after the cell loading, you can see cell loading. And what we do is, oh, I should mention that the gel channel is important for us because after we load the gels, during gyration, we understand that gel will contract. Because of that, it spontaneously generates what we call concave gel pocket. We'll form a pocket, gel pocket, concave shape. So because of that, now what we do is after cell loading, so we just tilt the device for 90 degree and wait for 10 minutes, allow the stem cells to, to, to settle into each pocket. So they will form initial cell cluster, and afterwards we just gently remove the floating cells. So I should point out, in fact, such microfluidic devices has been very commonly used and have been developed for many other applications, including, for example, studying, say, cancer cell migration, angiogenesis, right, and, uh, and some other uh, important applications. In fact, groups like uh, Roger Kent's group at MIT, and they have been, I would say, pioneering this, uh, using such devices for other applications. But for us, after we load the human propotent stem cells, that's you can take a look of the cartoon here now. After the cell loading and the initial clustering of the cells, the human propotent stem cells, they're just amazing. Again, 
They have amazing self-organizing properties and developmental potential. And once they start to form commonly, they start to talk to each other, and autonomously, you can see that from the cartoon, they organize themselves from a cavity. So you can watch the video here, and this is a video showing that a portion of the microfluidic device where five cell clusters and synchronized development from these five cell clusters. And obviously, you can see um, uh, the cavity formation. And because in this case, we are not adding any soluble external chemical signals to drive them to differentiate. In fact, this is what people call, you can call them apiblast-like structures, where the cells remain prepotent. And these are undifferentiated prepotent cells. But because this is a microfluidic device, in this sense, now we can we can add soluble factors we know are important to drive the human proponent stem cells to differentiate into embryonic lineages that are associated with progressive development of human embryo. So in this case, now after the cell initial cell clustering, now we are adding one soluble factor is what we call BMP4. And the reason we are adding BMP4, and you can see that we are adding BMP4 in such a way that only a portion of the cells in the cell cluster will be exposed to BMP4. By doing that, in fact, we can manually, we can, we can control the symmetry breaking events, and only the cells you can see from the cartoon exposed, directly exposed to the BMP4, this soluble factor treatment will differentiate into amyloidic ectoderm. They will break symmetry. And now we have complete control because this is BMP4 is added by us. By, by, the, uh, by the students in the lab, so it's not spontaneous differentiation anymore. But because the formation of the BMP4, or oh, sorry, the amyloidic ectoderm, the amyloidic ectoderm eventually, I, did, I, I didn't include the data here, eventually the, BMP, the amyloidic ectoderm, they will continue serving as local signaling center, and they were sending out soluble factors to continuously drive, for example, the un the apiblast here, compartment here, to drive their continuous development. So their intrinsic cell-cell interactions, tissue-tissue interactions, guiding the continuous development of such embryonic-like tissues. So let's watch the video here. You can see, again, synchronized development, and there's cavity formation here. And you can see, if you watch very carefully, the cells here, they are exposed directly to BMP4, the soluble factor. They become thinner and thinner. If you watch it again and carefully, so first there's cavity formation, and uh, then you can see the cells, let's watch carefully, the cells here, they become thinner and thinner, they are directly exposed to, to the soluble factor, they are differentiating, and soon after you can see the cells from the other compartment, and they are undergo gasolation-like events, and they will differentiate into the gem layers. So now, in fact, I think the key point, the message is, using engineering tools, now we can, we can, we can control and in a very controllable way to, uh, I would say, the, the progressive development of such embryo-like structures, the embryo models. All right. So just another uh, slide demonstrate the controllability and reproducibility, and to an extent, because this is a micro device, is a, is, a, is an engineering tool, and it's very easy to scale up. So indeed, we can now we can can generate a lot of such embryo-like structures or embryo, uh, embryo-like structures in, uh, 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 quite easily. Um, so you can see this is just another video showing nine, nine structures, colonies, their synchronized development. I should mention that a key advantage of such system is also because it's, it's so controllable and we know where, where are the cells, so it's very compatible with what we call live cell imaging. So we can use a microscope on the microscope, we can study the dynamics of embryonic developmental events. That's hard to study. You can imagine that when human embryo or any, even animal embryos, like, right, when they implant into the maternal uterus, they become almost invisible to study, especially the peri-implantation development. They are invisible to study. So model systems like this allow us to study dynamics you know, of the developmental events and understanding how the cells they talk to each other and dictate each other's progressive development. So, in fact, as I mentioned, I think another important uh, data I should present is the, the primordial germ cell, like cells, their appearance, their, their, their emergence in our system. As I mentioned, that in, in human, as well as monkey, as well as some other mammalian models, we understand that primordial germ cells, these are the precursor cells for sex cells. 
they will appear early after implantation but before gastrulation. So we decided to look into primordial germ cell-like cells in our model. And it turns out you can see that TF-AP2C, Nanog, and SOC17, and we, we basically use these markers to identify the primordial germ cells in our system. And the triple positive cells, if the cells show markers, so show these triple markers, and these are primordial germ cell-like cells. And indeed, you, you can see that from the staining images, and we start to see primordial germ cell-like cells in our model. And give us strong indication that indeed, I think our model, I, I think it's good to model, um, uh, to recapitulate uh, some key embryonic developmental events involved in human development. Okay. So I think I will stop here, and more or less this is a, 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 a presentation about the research activities from my group. And I should mention that there are a few other groups and uh, working on related questions using human prepotent stem cells. And, but here is a presentation about results from my group. Last time they were switching slideshows. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to tell you what I find fascinating about this work from a bioethics point of view. So thank you so much for that wonderful overview of, of the important work that you're doing. Um, so you may ask, well, what's the benefit of doing this kind of stuff? What can we gain from this sort of embryo modeling? Um, and two things. Someone that, in discussion with Dr. Fu, some of the really striking potential immediate benefits of this research. I'll give you just, just two. One, women who are pregnant um, take lots of prescribed drugs. And for 75% of those drugs that women take that are approved by their doctors, there's no data, zero data on the effects on developing embryos of these drugs. So if you have a mass scalable, controllable microfluidic system that will give you various aspects of embryo modeling to screen these drugs that could have an enormous impact on um, patient safety and the use of these drugs. So that's, that's area number one. That alone, I think, is an enormous advance. Number two, as Dr. Fu just said, this seems to be able to generate primordial germ cells. And there are other teams that are very interested in converting these primordial germ cells all the way down into mature sperm and eggs. So if you use iPS cells from living persons, so skin cells or blood cells converted into stem cells, load them into the channels, you can have a, pretty much an endless supply of patient-specific, person-specific primordial germ cells for further research and possibly rescue of infertility after, let's say, cancer treatment. So I think those are just two good examples of what could come out of this research. But then the question is, how do we know that any type of model really does recapitulate the real thing? How do you validate, how do you know that these models are accurate, especially if they're giving you so-called windows into the black box of human development after implantation when essentially women don't know that they're pregnant at that point. That's really pregnancy. So you would have to compare it to uh, your models to cultured natural embryos of fertility clinics. And this is the second part, the second aspect of the title that I gave for today, embryo uh, cultivation. So in 2016, there were two groups, Magdalena Zernica Getz in the University of Cambridge in the UK, and Ali Brivenlou uh, at Rockefeller University published these papers simultaneously in the journal, uh, journals Nature, Cell Biology, and and what they did was they were able to, and you may have heard about this in the news, culture fertility clinic embryos, which are derived from fertilizing eggs, so natural human embryos, or as we call intact natural human embryos, culture them in a dish up to the 14-day legal limit, as it's a legal limit in the UK, and up to the 14-day recommended limit under guidelines in the US. So the New York group voluntarily stopped. The Cambridge group had to stop, otherwise they could go to jail. And what did they do? They, they we're able to cultivate embryos, but with very low efficiency. I was told by Magdalena, she was in a meeting in Barcelona, that they got about 10% of their embryos to get to right around day 13 before they fixed them on a slide in any of their experiments, um, which is still, uh, you know, it's lower efficiency, but it was still remarkable that they got any to go to that point. Because prior to Magdalena and Ali's work, the record was, I think, about seven days. So they, 
easily double that. It could have possibly gone further, but uh, the culture systems at that point haven't yet been optimized, and further work has to be done. So you may ask, well, what's important about um, the 14-day limit? So I'm going to let Dr. Fu come up and just explain a little bit more about prolonged culture of embryos, and then we'll get back into uh, what is the 14-day limit and why is that a thing in biologics. So, yeah. uh, thanks, Ying Xiu. Indeed, I think it's important to talk about why there's still room for improvement even for prolonged culture of human embryos, but we understand that culture of a human embryos in visual by itself is still controversial and uh, still have some ethical limits, right? 14 day rule is in place for that. But let's take a look of, in fact, I want to go back uh, before I, okay, okay. Let's, so you can see, let's go back to the standing images here. In fact, I should point out, you can see that from the images, let's go to day 10, day 13, day, day 10, day 11. Even though I think the, as, as Insu mentioned, uh, the, the, the groups, they have stopped their experiment as day 13. But as, as that point, even as day 13, or as this point, right now the image is here at day 10, but you can see that more or less what they have shown here, the human embryo, they still have only been start to forming a cavity that's surrounded by the prepotent epiblast. And this is what we call pro cavity. But unfortunately, maybe we still don't know why. And I think possibly because of in vitro culture environment and the human embryo, they are not developing as well as in uterus. Because we know that if the human embryo develops in uterus, by day 10, day 11, or I would say towards day 14, in fact, the immunotic epidermis should start to form and uh, the symmetry breaking should be present. So what I'm trying to say that, in fact, the existing human embryo cultures, and even by day, day 10, day 11, or even day 13, they haven't started to observe, doesn't allow us to observe those slightly more advanced developmental events that are still remain unknown for us to study. And so, so let me go back to this. So now, in fact, again, even though we are now be able to culture human embryos, for up to day 14 in a tissue culture, doesn't mean that the human embryo in a culture dish, they will develop as well compared to human embryo development in a maternal uterus. So there are key developmental landmarks missing from this in vitro culture of the human embryo. I'm talking about, for example, the amniotic ectoderm development, symmetry breaking, and the primordial germ cell development as well. In fact, uh, I saw a recent paper from UCLA, and they were working on studying human primordial germ cell development. And I was reading very carefully the numbers, and they culture, they studied, they examined hundreds of intact human embryos cultured up to day 13, day 13 in a culture dish. Only one of them, they, they, they see one PGC cells. One PGC cells. But, so I think there are room for improvement. And, but of course we understand that that's day 14 for human embryo cultures. And uh, that's the reason now people start to rely on other primate models. I'm talking about primate monkey embryo models. And because there's no 14-day rule for primate monkey embryo culture, so now people are pushing and uh, try to improve the culture environment in a culture dish and to culture the monkey embryos longer and longer. So now, in fact, the two papers and published quite recently, in fact, November 2019, and both papers, and they were able to culture the human, oh, sorry, monkey embryos and beyond early gastrulation and almost towards, I would say, around day 20. And uh, so start to, people start to see gastrulation in this cultured monkey embryos. And, uh, and so yeah, that's another way, I guess, for people to, to to leverage the, the, the monkey embryos, availability of monkey embryos, the fact that we don't have legal limit for culture human uh, monkey embryos in a culture dish, and using such primary model systems, hopefully will help us to understand better human development. Right. Okay. You can see these are color coded. I'm red, he's black. <laughs> um, so we've been talking about the 14-day rule, and if some of you just don't know what the heck this is, let me explain it to you. 
Uh, these are the questions that I'm going to try to address. What is it? How does it apply to embryo modeling research? Does it apply to embryo modeling research? So let me tell you a funny story about this, uh, this paper that we published on Star Wars Day, May the 4th, 2016. Uh, funny, not in like it's hilarious, but it's kind of mildly interesting. Um, so I had written a commentary about how some, it may be possible in the near future that human embryo modeling research could raise interesting questions of applicability of the 14-day rule, which again, I still haven't explained what that case is. And that people got accepted in Nature and was waiting in the wings. And then I get a call from the editor saying, we just got these two papers accepted. They're coming out on May the 4th, uh, advanced publication on natural embryo cultivation, which are the two that I mentioned from Magdalena's group and Ali's group. And they said, can you modify this 14-day rule paper to take into account natural embryo cultivation that got up to the 14-day Mark and I said, well, I didn't, I didn't know that the, you got these papers, and I didn't know exactly. I don't know anything about the papers that are forthcoming. They said, well, don't worry, because we have these two other authors who were involved in the ethical review of the New York paper, Amy Walkerson and Josephine Johnson. So they joined me on this paper. I um, we changed the intro and the conclusion, but kept everything else from my original commentary in the middle, and then we pulled out into a text publication. You can see this publication, the embryo modeling specific language that I had in the. So this is kind of a, a strange kind of like hybrid sort of thing that came together at the end. Um, but what we raised was the question of, is it now time to revisit this? And by revisit, we don't mean actually changing it, but just thinking about it again, revisiting that rule. The 14-day rule is a, is a long-standing established um, limit on how long you can culture research embryos in a lab. And this was uh, made famous by the Warnock Committee in the UK, which was established after the advent of IVF and mutual fertilization, when it was soon realized that not only can you transfer human embryos that were created outside the womb back into the womb for reproduction, but one might also divert it over for research use, and not only research use, but study in the culture for, for some time. So there was a great deal of anxiety, a great deal of public discourse around this. And so Mary Warnock, a philosopher, Cambridge, uh, convened a, um, a committee. And uh, Anne McLaren was also a, a key member of this committee. Anne McLaren is, is a, a goddess of um, developmental biology. And she uh, was the one who helped develop mouse IVF for research purposes. And so uh, there were two key figures, philosophy and science, working together with their committee to try to come up with compromises and guidelines which then later became law in the UK. So that's why in the UK you can't, by law, go past 14 days, whereas in many other countries it's just a guideline. Now, why is the 14-day limit thought to be important? Um, does anybody know what people believe happens right around the 14th consecutive day of development time point of human embryology? It's when you first may see the appearance of primitive streak. That's when you first then get uh, north-south axis of the embryo. And you don't quite have a central nervous system yet, but you have a, an area that people think will eventually become the central nervous system. I think, well, why was this a nice compromise stopping point? Well, there are lots of different versions of what makes this a good rule, lots of different perspectives. One is practically very easy. You just mark out two weeks on your lab calendar, so don't go past this date, right? So that's easy. It's easy for regulation because you have to enforce the rule legally, right? So um, you have to have some marker to know that you're, you're coming up to the line, to the deadline. So the primitive streak, people believed back then, was visible. So you can see it developing under the microscope, and you know that it's about time to wrap it up. But sometimes the primitive streak could appear earlier than 14 consecutive days of development. Um, from a religious point of view, look, I mean, you had some people who tried to make this argument, and it was persuasive to some, and that is that 14 days is the, is the uh, point at which the embryo can no longer twin or fuse together. So that must be the earliest that the soul enters the body, because souls cannot be fused together. Souls cannot be divided. So if an embryo, in principle, could be divided multiple times in the lab, you can actually do embryo splitting. You can create many copies in the lab in early, early stages. Well, then the soul can't be there, because then God will be just too busy dropping souls in. Right? Or when two fuse together, where did the, one of the souls go? You can't have two souls together. So it made some sense from a theological point of view to some people. Uh, but it was practically extremely useful. And how useful was it? It was so useful that now we have 
human embryo research, which led, which led to the derivation of human embryonic stem cells, which then led to the development of uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. If you didn't have knowledge about how human ES cells behave, you can make an artificial one. And then now the, the field, the rule, was so successful in carving out a space of, to, 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 to experiment a timeline that we may have outgrown it. Now we're to the point where, well, now science can actually get us past this. If they didn't imagine back then it would ever be possible to get even past seven days, much less 14, and now we're right there at that limit. Now, the 14-day rule is not one rule. It's constantly evolving. So I mentioned the UK Warnock Committee. That's actually the second bullet point. The very first time it ever appeared was in the US, in the US Ethics Advisory Board, 1979, uh, who recommended to the government right after IVF, federal government, uh, guidelines for the funding of IVF research. You know, the, the, the guidelines are pretty darn good, but there's a time-honored tradition in the U.S. of getting good guidelines and then not using them and actually not allowing the research to be federally funded. So this was just too hot. They didn't want to touch this. But this is the first time they articulated 14 days is the important time point. And notice, the first version says 14 days after fertilization. So they're talking about zygotes in the cultivation of natural human embryos. Why did they pick 14? There are different versions of this. One story that I heard was pretty compelling was if you go too far out above day 14, then you might start to trigger laws at that time that governed over in vitro research and fetuses, and they didn't want to trigger that whole complex thing. So they said, we'll stop well before we ever get to that point. Not that we ever think that you can get up to day 14 in the dish. So there may have been some US political and legal reasons to drawing the line at 14. Well, the Warnock Committee, I don't know if they got the idea from the US, but they also landed on 14 after much deliberation. Then you see Canada. Again, first three, they're all fertilizations, I guess, right? The last one uh, on this slide, NIH embryo panel. During the Clinton years, there was another NIH group that came up with funding guidelines for embryo research. Again, beautiful set of guidelines, never used. Too hot. But they actually expand quite a bit. They actually let you go a little bit past day 14 if what you wanted to study is gastro relation. So it's actually not a hard limit of and then they also save space for, in the future, the possibility, which came four years later, of studying human embryonic stem cells. And you say, these are not embryos, these stem cells. What's funny is, well, what happens when you put them all together? Maybe a single stem cell is not totally potent, it's not like a zygote. But what if you put them all together in a tight, tight bunch, and does the whole composite thing become an embryo? Well, flash forward to stem cell guidelines, 2005, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, look, continues to evolve the 14-day rule, because now they say, Regardless of derivation method, what do they have in mind here? Cloning. They also had nuclear transfer. That's not fertilization. So it doesn't matter how you derived it, but whatever this thing is, if it can make a baby on a plantation, and again, how would you know that? No longer 14 days or formation of the primitive streak, because sometimes that can come earlier than 14 days, whichever occurs first. That's what they say. What did the International Society for Stem Cell Research say? What do we say now? Well, uh, the, tw the latest version that we worked on, 2016, has this language. This is under prohibited. This is, you should not do this, or else you will violate international citizen guidelines. Now, what do we mean by this? I'm not entirely sure. George Daly and I wrote this paragraph. And at the time, we said, this is a very rapidly moving area. Let's kind of be vague, like say something, but be a little vague, because we know that the science is going to move forward in unpredictable ways. So what do we prohibit? We said in vitro culture of any intact human preamp plantation embryo or organized embryo-like cellular structure with human organismal potential. That was George Haley. I said, well, what is human organismal potential? Well, I don't know. I will let make a baby if you implant it. <laughs> OK, so that's what I mean. That's how we were not even really sure. Regardless of derivation method, so we borrowed that from NAS, beyond 14 days or formation of the permanent streak, whichever comes first. So the question is, is the work that Dr. Fu and colleagues doing in violation of this, um, this guideline? So it all depends on what we mean by organized embryo-like cellular structure with human organisms. We definitely didn't want to say souls here. So internationally, this is from the, the Nature publication that I did with Josephine and Amy. Um, they asked me, Dr. Kian, can you give us a really nice uh, picture of an embryo? I said, nobody. We're so tired of seeing like pictures of embryos in these embryo papers. Let's come up with a map, a policy map. So the map is coded. Okay, so dark blue is where it is against the law to go past 14 days. So you notice Canada, Australia, right? Sweden, UK, Spain, 
And then uh, the lighter blue is encoded in specific scientific guidelines, China, India, Japan, South Korea, US. Um, but I would actually say that the entire globe, so everything else is like, you know, there's no statement in Africa, countries in Africa or South America. Uh, I would actually say that the entire globe is light blue because of the international guidelines. The international guidelines apply internationally to whatever people are doing this kind of research. So uh, there is something out there. I think um, it's going to be complex to change the 14 day rule in places where it's encoded in the law because then you have to follow procedures for changing the law in those jurisdictions. Um, so things are moving very quickly. So in December 13, 2018, Dr. Fu and I, Zernika Gatz, many other people wrote another commentary in Nature just saying, look, we need to start a debate. We need clarity around this area for embryo modeling. Um, and uh, so that got some of the conversation going again. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Fu and just have him explain how they approach some of their publications because I highlighted their ethics statement for you, my highlighter. And, uh, and, and just tell us, like, yeah, what was your thinking here? <laughs> well, uh, yeah. So this Obviously, is on their nature paper. Right. And this is the, the ASCO statement, uh, ASIC statement. Uh, we, we include it in, uh, uh, into the, the end of our paper. So we made a statement that we don't believe that we don't believe that the, the, the embryo-like structures, and I have shown you, um, we don't think that they they have human organismal form or potential. And the reason uh, we believe that is because obviously, and uh, those embryo-like structures are generated from human proponents themselves, and the structures they are lacking certain actual embryonic cell types. I'm talking about trophoblast. I'm also talking about hyperblast. And those are actual embryonic cell types that will be critical for, for continuous successful pregnancy and eventually they will develop into yolk sac and placenta. So obviously those will be needed for successful pregnancy and continuous development of the human fetus. And so that's our argument, and obviously, and all our experiments, they are terminated way before day 14, because, in fact, if you, if you saw the time scale in our movies, and in fact, we, we terminate all our experiment within about four days. And, but I understand that, in fact, that commenting on this uh, human organism form or potential, especially the potential, right, and not to mention so, and uh, it's, it, that particular term is very hard to, uh, to experimentally prove or disprove. Um, but given the fact that I think from, from, uh, from the scientist's perspective, um, as well as in our work, as long as we can make sure that there are key cell types, I'm talking about, for example, trophoblast, which is needed for placenta formation, they're not involved, included in our model. And we know that there's no way the cell colony will be able to develop into a human baby. Right? I think that can be accepted. Um, so yeah, um, and we have been very transparent. And uh, all the protocols we used in our research um, have been approved by our the Human Stem Cell Research Committee. Uh, I'm talking about Human Proposed Stem Cell Research Oversight Committee at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And I, I've been very happy and also uh, to form close, I would say, collaborations with people like Insu, I think make sure that and the constant cross talk between scientists like us and the ask um, uh, experts, ask uh, ask experts, and we have we com uh, constantly communicate and understand. Um, so to 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 make sure that we are we are we are not passing the red line, <laughs> right? Okay. Why is it so important to constantly be in communication with one another, people like Jinping Fu and myself? Well, I don't want Jinping to end up in jail or anybody in his lab. And I don't want anybody to inadvertently get in trouble because, you know, when people get trained as mechanical engineers or cell biologists, they don't necessarily always get training in bioethics as part of their curriculum. They don't always get training in, in state law. Um, what does the law say? I looked this up. Michigan. State allows human embryo and embryonic stem cell research, but has a 14-day limit and bans reproductive cloning. So if you're using IPS cells from living donors, and you're making these embryo models, are these clones? You know, the word clone is uh, from the Greek word clone, which means twig, and it comes from horticulture. 
It's not somatic cell nuclear transfer. You put the nucleus of a somatic cell into a denucleated egg and then make that sort of an embryo. That, that's not, it's when you take a twig off a geranium and plant that, and when it gives rise to a whole new plant, then you have a clone. You take a twig, and the twig makes a plant. Take skin cells from a person and clump them together, and they, under the right bioengineering, create a whole new individual. So some could debate that this is getting us closer to human cloning without get, using eggs. Um, there's a question of, does the 14-day limit even apply here? Massachusetts, what does it say here? State law bans human reproductive cloning. OK, so no baby making for cloning technology, creating human embryos for research purposes. So you can't make a human embryo for research purposes, regardless of where you get your funding. And then uh, experimentations on fetuses, but explicitly allows pre-implantated embryos, blah, blah, blah. So there's some room for debate, depending on how complex these models get, of whether something is permitted or not in the state. Um, things are moving very quickly. So just a few days ago, this report was published in uh, the ISSCR Society Journal Stem Cell Reports. In fact, I, just, I guess just a month ago, we couldn't give this exact same talk because things were moving so quickly. This was just published. So it's me and several members of ISSCR, uh, scientists, developmental biologists, et cetera, who just said, look, we need to come, toward, come forward with clearer guidelines around this area of embryo-like modeling. Um, and so we propose some general statements just to start discussion going, because we know the guidelines internationally are currently under the process of being revised. So this is kind of almost like a little nudge or a background paper to help the rest of the committee uh, deliberate on these issues. Now, we did set forward some recommendations. We said, look, human models that don't integrate all the embryonic and extra embryonic lineages so should be exempt from mandatory review. So the stem cell committees don't have to review this because they're not complete. It's all in vitro with established cell lines. If you disassemble your embryo model at the time of prune district formation, but you continue to culture the various components, again, should be exempt from uh, mandatory stem cell research ethical review. At no time should you transfer any of these constructs into a uterus of an animal or a human. But then that leaves this question. What if somebody wants to study the complete thing? So my advice to labs like Jing Ping Fu's is for the time being, because of lack of clarity of what exactly of the law, state level or national level apply here, whether 14-day rule applies or not, just to sort of avoid any unnecessary controversy now and to let the field breathe and grow on its own a little bit. Try to always leave something out <laughs> of the model. Don't try to strive to make one model do everything, because that's going to trigger all these legal questions. For now. I'm not saying don't ever do it, but for now, that might be the wiser thing to go. I don't want anybody in this lab in Michigan to go to jail. Okay? But the question then remains, what if somebody wants to have all the parts together to see how the whole model runs? That's a very good question. That's the question that right now we are discussing at Level. So we have the International Society for Stem Cell Research um, revising, yet again, our guidelines, which we think we're probably going to have to revise every five years or so now, given the case of science. And what we said right now is that's the key question. Is the subject to the 14-day rule if you want to try to model the entire embryo? Why or why not? Um, should someone ever try to do this kind of work? So I invite you now to participate by giving us your, your comments and your questions. Um, we've just raised lots of issues. I don't think we've really answered anything. But uh, I really invite you now to, to we have half an hour. So we have, we have time to talk. And we'll come up here. And, and use these mics and push the button. Oh, yeah. Read. Yeah. So you have mics on the desk in front of you. Make sure that you press the button. You have to keep it pressed because it has to be green for us to hear you. Um, I also want to just give a plug real quickly. Next month, uh, March 19th, we have Paula Arlada and I, uh, we're going to present on brain organoids. So you heard a little bit about organoids. We're going to pull the most controversial one out. Brain organoids, you might even bring some to show and tell. Um, and we'll have our conversation here. And then the month after that, um, the first Thursday in April, Roger Cam from MIT, who we mentioned a few times, uh, helped develop the microfluidic systems. He'll be talking with us about multicellular engineered living systems. Uh, we have one last one in uh, May, uh, yeah, in May, and that's, uh, that's public deliberation, uh, precautionary principle, and uh, there's sort of a few more to come. All right, so 
With that, let's go ahead and open it up for questions. Christine, were you just going to moderate? Sure. Um. Thanks to both of you. Super interesting stuff. So I'm, I'm curious, um, you mentioned into some dissatisfaction with how the, how the rules were created but not used. Mm -hmm. Also, there's just the fact that some of the regulations don't seem to be applicable anymore. They're evolving. So in addition to your work, both of you, in rethinking the rules, are you also rethinking how these procedures should work? So the, the process of developing regulations, do you have any insights about how we could do better moving forward? That um, that's a really really good question. So I I personally think that that should so so let me, let me back up. The international task force to develop revisions to the ICCR guidelines. We're just I think we're still sort of in the first few months of our work. So there's still much more ahead of us than we've already accomplished. My personal view is to is to exactly do some of that. So if it is on the table right now, we're talking about the 14 day rule for natural embryos, and we were talking about whether what are the limits, if any, on, on uh, embryo modeling work. So we haven't decided anything yet, um, but we're, we're starting that conversation. So A, the topic is on the table for discussion. Then the question is, what is the best process by which we, we do that? Now, I think that the Warnock process was I mean, people don't really realize just how political that was. That was extremely contentious. And it took about two years. And there were like 70 or 90 different societies that commented and gave feedback, medical societies. So um, I, I, I don't know if, if we want to wait two years and, and, and go through all that. I think in the current political climate in the US, it's actually kind of dangerous to, to offer something like that for renegotiation because you might actually get things yanked away, freedoms yanked away, right? So I don't, I, I, that's a really good question. You know, I, I certainly am going to bring to the task force the need to deliberate about the deliberation and about the process. You know, I don't really know, though, what, what's optimal. It's really tough. And the other thing to keep in mind is this is an international society. So we've always held a position that you should always follow local law, of course, but where the law is silent, we offer the guidelines. And they're just guidelines, or we can't enforce them. Um, is that a different process than to come up with guidelines than law in a pluralistic or a democratic society? I think the process could be different for guidelines. Um, I, uh, so that's an excellent point. I, 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 I'm going to bring it up for discussion you know, to talk about process, but I, I, I can't even really recommend what we think, what we should think is the best process for international society, for that society. Sort of to follow up on that, um, the 14-day rule was born in the context of in vitro fertilization. So that was, aside from the fact that you were uniting gametes natural, that you know, gametes were natural, things like that. Um, and Dr. Fu, I thought your ethics statement was really nice that you included this statement of these constructs don't, they don't contain structures that would be required in, a, in an actual pregnancy. But I'm wondering, uh, when members of the public that are not scientists are part of this debate, that distinction of synthetic may really not be appreciated. I just wonder, both of you, maybe your thoughts on that point, um, mm -hmm. that uh, non-scientists, I think, it may, not, it may not be relevant, that really important point. Um, OK, well, I, I'll, I'll start off. Um, you're right. You're right. Uh, and, I, and I think that um, you'll never make everybody happy. Um, what to say about that? Um, so here's, here's, here's a puzzle I have that I'm wrestling with. I mean, how would one know that you don't have that potential unless you try the experiment of uterine transfer? OK, so I guess we're in some trouble if monkey embryo models make monkeys. I mean, in the time of nuclear transfer, cloning, so when Dolly was cloned, people assumed all you got to do is replace the sheep cells with human cells and you can get a cloned human baby like you got Dolly the sheep. Now we know from years of experience that it's not that simple and the technology is not equally transferable to all these different species. So just because you have mice that are cloned doesn't mean you can have human babies, right? Uh, to the cloning procedure. But I think that there could be quite a conversation if you start getting mouse pups from these mouse models, if you start getting, especially non-human primate, offspring. So how would one know? 
Um, but but back to the messaging issue of like this, who, the, would the public even care about these extra embryonic lineages? Like, does it matter or not? Um, maybe one way forward is to sort of you know again double down on that 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 red line we seem to have in the current stem cell reports document and what we're going to say in the ICCR, I can be very confident of this, no uterine transfer, right? So the uterus is a new line. Like, that's the line. You keep it in the dish, but no uterine transfer. Maybe if we say that, that's still not going to, that's still not going to please the folks who would say for human embryonic stem cell research, I don't care if it's transferred to the uterus or not, these embryos have complete human organismal potential if they were transferred into the uterus. Uh, why? Because we know from IVF that that happens, that works with reasonable efficiency. Um, so they might still say, oh, likewise here, right? The, the red line of the uterus does not matter. They still have this potential. I don't know how you would know that without doing the experiment, because I think the experiment would be unethical. This, here's a, here's a mind-blowing question, too. Well, what if somebody wants to do that as a way to sort of overcome infertility? So what if somebody wants to create an embryo model for, uh, and talking with people like Magdalena uh, just a few days ago, I said, well, would it even be possible to take these embryo models and transfer them and, like, would it, would it do anything? She said, and they're pretty far, the models are pretty far along, but it's well past implantation. How would you get the uterus ready for that? So there are all these other issues that maybe you can try to convince people it would never work, even if you try, so don't bother. Um, but that's a really good point. Yeah, I mean, people, people, people will defend their conclusions that they're really wedded to and committed to religiously or philosophically, uh, no matter what you, you try to explain is or is not the case. So, I don't know. I mean, like I said, you, I'll just return to you just can't make everybody happy. But maybe try to make as many people happy as possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have much to add. Uh, just as Insu mentioned, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's hard to make everyone happy. Uh, from scientist's perspective, I think uh, to, as I mentioned, uh, to make sure that we constantly talk, uh, let us constant cross talk and uh, input from ethics community, right, and also make our, make sure our research activities in the lab are transparent and to the society, to the, to the administration, and to the regulators, and to the funding agencies, in fact. And uh, so I think that's also very important. And uh, right, and bring, make sure that, for example, for people like me and uh, attending this seminar and give a talk about our research, I think it's, uh, I recognize over time is, is uh, its importance, and uh, as as Insu mentioned that right, as a mechanical engineer, and sometimes we were, we have been very naive sometimes, very naive. Even when we get started working with human proponent stem cells, the thinking was very naive, very naive. We wasn't thinking anything ethic issues. When I first saw the microfluidic system, I asked Dr. Fu, does it have to look like that? I mean, like 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 mass mass printing of embryos, and he said, well. It does because you have to you have to have them all together in the same media, and, and that's how you get the consistency. Like you know, baking a dozen cookies at the same time will get you more consistent cookies than trying to trying to do one at a time. So that's how you get the, the utility for for drug screening. That's how you get the actual value socially from this kind of work. But it may strike people in a little off-putting way because what's the immediate trope? It's the embryo generation for commercial commercial use. Yeah. Sorry to bring that up again, but. <laughs> um, let me offer a, a, a quick analysis. Dan, you have to push that button down and hold it. Oh, hold it. OK. Yeah. I'll keep my finger there. Uh, let me offer a, a, a quick analysis and tell me where I go wrong. OK, so here it is. Uh, first thing is, Sci uh, Dr. Fu, you, you're a scientist. You want to be in touch with, in, in contact, and in conversation with the ethicists. Partly because you don't want to go to jail. <laughs> sure. Yeah. But I can assume also you want to do the right thing. Right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, so focusing for a moment on this ethics thing, doing the right thing. Um, the science is changing, and so we ask um, under these very different circumstances, uh, where it, you know it's not an IVF, et cetera, and uh, um, uh, does the 14-day rule still apply? Okay, Deb. But to ask that question, surely we have to ask what was the 14-day rule supposed to be doing there? Mm -hmm. And here we have a big problem, as you 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 said uh, very quickly. You said it was a compromise. 
And that's the key word, I think. That on the on the Warnock Commission, people had different points of view. Mm -hmm. They finally decided to agree on 14 days, but there was no no plurality of people who could offer a reason why 14 days is of any significance, whatever. And so, you know, you mentioned one of the few coherent um, uh, rationales that was offered by a member of the committee, which is this magical thing about souls, you know, the souls not getting together, you know, the supernatural stuff. Now, surely that has no place in a secular argument. Maybe, you know, this is purely theology. So what, what is the secular rationale? Well, there isn't one. It's just that there was an agreement that, look, uh, we all disagree. Mm -hmm. So why don't we say 14 days? And each of us will have a mental reservation in our minds. Here's my reason for 14 days. Well, maybe it's because uh, that's one that would allow a lot of the research we think it should happen to happen without anyone worrying about going to jail. And, and it's far enough away from the limits of what we can do so we don't have to worry about this you know, for a long time. But that's not a rationale. And so when we ask, well, now the science has changed, so does it still apply? That's a non-question. What's the it? If it was just a compromise, there's no principle whatever. So that means there cannot be an answer to this question. It cannot be. Uh, now, what do you do? Well, uh, I think the main question is, uh, are you, why pick this ball up and run with this 14 days? You, you wrote it into the ISSCR guidelines. That's a bit of a surprise. Why? Well, probably for the same reason as it's been carried along all this time. Well, everyone sort of salutes it. No one quite knows what it means. Uh, it seems to protect a lot of what we want to do. We don't have to worry about it. But it's not because it tells us ethically what's the right thing. No one agrees on what, what it says about that at all. Yeah. Okay, straight me out. Uh, no, no. Well, I, I, I'm going to agree with you. I, look, there, there's when, you, when we ask the question in the commentary, should we revisit the 14-day rule and should we change it? If you're going to change the rule, you have to kind of know, well, what kind of rule is it to even know what the rules of changing a rule is, whether it's a legal rule or, or ethical rule or anything like that. And we didn't, we didn't find any clear answer to the question of what is it? You know, what is the 14-day rule supposed to do? But I, I think you articulated it great. I mean, it was a back then, historically, it was a compromise. All the other articulations of it that follow the Warnock Committee, by the way, it just repeats basically the same language. And what I think happened was people just said, well, that looked good. We'll just do that. So I didn't show you the full list. There's, there's many, like Japan, China, they, they have many, many articulations of it. And they just recycle it. So I asked also Charo, because she was part of the NAS Committee, uh, the, the NIH committee in, in uh, 2019. I said, did you know, when I was doing research for the paper, I said, did you know that the first time that showed up was 1978 in the U.S.? And she said, oh, really? Because on the NIH panel, we thought we were copying the Warnock report. Like, they were just recycling it because it, it was working. So it kind of started as a compromise, and then people didn't really know why they were putting it in, but they kind of felt it was a good idea because it's popular, and, uh, and it would be weird not to repeat that because then you have to justify why you're not going to repeat it. So that's why we put it into ISSR guidelines. He said, look, in the first version of 2006, before the embryo modeling stuff happened, right? We said, well, it would be kind of weird not to mention the 14-day rule, so why don't we just throw that in there, okay? So it was kind of this, this tradition. And now we face the question of what is a compromise? What is the compromise now? I think it's back to the original question of back uh, when they first formulated their 14-day rule, what's to be gained and what are we trying to sort of avoid? What are the concerns we're trying to sort of try to allay, right? So I think it's a public policy tool to allow practically meritorious science to go forward while at the same time doing something, and no one's done the study, to reassure the public somehow that we're not going to you know, go down a slippery slope and we're going to check ourselves. This is all completely just speculative because no one's actually done the study. This is actually how it functions in society. But that's a rationale I think people had in mind. It was kind of like letting, giving us a playing field to do our work and collect data and do meritorious science while at the same time telling people there are boundaries around this football field. There, is, there are things that we will not do, we will not cross. But, you know, so people describe it as a line in the sand. Right? But I grew up in California, and we played on the beach all day and drove all, drew all kinds of land, lines in the sand. And we knew that at the end of the day, the tides would change, and we're going to lose all these lines. So I think what's happening now is the tides are changing with advancement of science. Now we have to say, what do we have to gain, and what do we have to lose with the changing of the tides? And it's going to have to be a compromise again. So back to Matthew's question. I think you're right. I think that's a really nice way to put it. It was, what is it? It's a compromise. 
So when you compromise, both sides have to kind of give up something, right? You kind of have to come to some sort of some happy medium. So we have to then know, well, who are these sides and what are their interests and kind of work it out. Because we kind of know what the scientific interest is going forward. And then the question is, what are people afraid of? And is the new line going to be 21 days? Well, then you start getting cardiac cells beating. That's, you know, can you imagine a 3D model with a little thing beating in there? That's a little, for some people, over the line, over the comfort zone. So we don't really know where to redraw it. That's the problem. If you're going to draw the line, where do you redraw it? that would, again, strike a balance. And again, no one's in the study, it's in the, sociologically, does it actually make people comfortable? But uh, it's gonna be something like that compromise between two sides, but we haven't identified who the parties are and what their interests are. We knew over two years of Warnock who the warring sides were and how to get the votes in parliament because they had to pass parliament. Okay, but there's nothing like that in the US and I can't imagine trying something like that right now. Um, yeah, thank you, but yeah, I think that's it. The it is it's a compromise. Jantine? Um, yeah, just briefly hearing these two views, wouldn't and then be more, not more honest to say it's prudential reasoning and not ethical reasoning? Because what I hear you both exchange is, is a debate about um, yeah. arguments from prudence. Right, right. And, yeah, and yeah. Generally... I didn't quite use that term, but that's a good term to use. In, in the nature commentary, it's a public policy tool. That's what I, call, I called it a public policy tool, to carve out a space for research while at the same time supposedly allaying people's concerns about science just going way too far. Okay, so, and that's why I said this, it was not an ethical rule, because I said in the paper, it doesn't seem to make any sense philosophically, secular, philosophically. Maybe moral theology, I don't know, maybe if you're a Catholic theologian, believe in Solman, but from a secular ethics point of view, I, I could not find a good rationale. So it can't be a secular ethics rule. What kind of rule is it? It's not a secular ethics rule. It's a rule for social harmony is a rule for, yeah, it's a pragmatic thing. Uh, so that's what I try to sort of reframe it as that. If that's it, then the rules for that kind of rule change will be prag pragmatic kind of, you know, bartering or, or bargaining, compromising of interests, which has an underlying philosophical basis and, and, you know, kind of, I guess, you know, pluralism kind of basis in the value of that. But it's very different than saying it's an ethical rule, because if it's an ethical rule, it just takes one philosopher to come up with the best ethical argument, and there you go. You move the line if the argument's persuasive. It's not that kind of rule, though. Yeah, but the imminent message to the public is moral. Like, yeah. This, is, yeah. folks, well, well, this is in all ethics statements, because this yeah. is the moral Well, way. it was so, the ethics statement so that's, that's for sort nature. Of the, it's sort of the, and um, I think it, that's what I would call it. It's it's a little bit. Maybe we, we should think about how to be a bit more honest about it, and <laughs> because you know, mor moral moral like has yeah. like a high price, and it yeah. sounds great. Yeah. But uh, if ICCR it's says case, this is not a moral rule. Relax, <laughs> relax, folks. It's not a moral rule. <laughs> yeah. Um, you have a question, sir. Oh, I do have a question. Yeah. Um, Good, good talk. You talked about two technologies kind of moving forward in tandem, the extended embryo culture and the embryo models. There's a third one, I guess, the ISSCR is dealing with, which is the chimeras, human embryo, human animal embryo chimeras. So if the synthetic embryo is animal, uh, but it's also a chimera with human cells, then uh, what are your, uh, where are the lines in terms of implantation uh, and so on? Because I think those experiments are probably occurring. So, it, Jimmy, is there interest in creating chim chimera? Means um, an entity that has cell populations from more than one zygote, and they can be different species zygotes. Okay, so if you have cell populations, with iPS cells from human or iPS cells from chimp, is anybody interested in making embryo models that mix pluripotent cells from different species? So I, I, I guess the the conversation, the discussion here is uh, is hinging on the fact that there, there's a group from uh, from uh, from San Diego and working with uh, with scientists in China, and injecting human embryonic stem cells into monkey embryo, and they have been culturing those monkey embryo up to up around I would say day thirty, and uh, they are. They, they, I guess the claim is the fact that they, they are hoping that such human monkey chimera system uh, in the long-term future will allow to generate uh, for the possibility generating human organs uh, and those organs will be useful for organ transplantation uh, and using using monkey as a host um, so I guess that's your uh, really the conversation here um, but I think uh, I don't think there's a legal guideline right now, right, available for such research. I guess a lot of research activities are moving towards different directions or so fast, and uh, sometimes the legal guidelines are 
they, they are trying to catch up. Yeah, yeah um, the, the ISCR has a lot of work ahead of us. So I'm the chair, co-chairperson of the committee on guidelines for organoids and chimeras. And so your question is, is, is the hot button question right now. What are the limits, if any, around using monkey host embryos and transferring human pluripotent stem cells into them and culturing them in a dish? Because as you saw in one of Dr. Fu's slides, there's no 14-day rule for a primate embryo cultivation. There's no limit. Okay, so if you can transfer a whole bunch of human stem cells into that, is that a way to sort of bypass a human 14-day rule? Uh, so I'll tell you what happens in the UK. In the UK, everything's regulated by the Human uh, Fertilization Embryology Authority. And um, they have a definition of an admixed embryo. So I had to look all the stuff up, folks, for, for our ICR guidelines. Um, so you can really dig into the weeds of some of these regulations. So in the HFEA, what they say is an admixed embryo is defined as one that is, uh, you know, a mixed embryo of species where the human contribution predominates. And then my question is, what does that mean? Is that percentage of cells? Or you might think of it as maybe it's not the per majority percentage of cells, but it's all in the central nervous system. So it's really the central nervous system that makes something human-like, moral, and, uh, and that's what we're worried about. So that's, it's not clear. Because I don't think anyone's done an experiment to propose that to the HFE. But what they said is it's reviewable and, in principle, allowable. They said, if you're going to mix embryos, if it's human predominance, they are present, then HFEA will impose a 14-day rule on that entity. Because that's their answer. And then the question is, well, can you give us more clarity? I don't think anyone's actually tried that work. So there's some precedent in the UK for something on paper about that. Is that permissible or not? Um, so we have to discuss what will the International Society say, because all we have is this one vague language in the HFEA in the UK, and there are people who may go to China to do this work or may do it in other places outside of, outside of the UK, outside of that jurisdiction. So we have to contemplate this. I, I'll tell you right now, it doesn't look like from the data that we are aware of, uh, unpublished data that you're going to get more than just like 3% human contribution because that's really hard to make the human stem cells last there. But maybe, who knows, they, they might get better. So they're kind of far away from any definition of human preponderance, predominance. Um, but that's, that is the issue that is keeping me up right now <laughs> with, with so our guidance. I can also follow on this, uh, this conversation. In fact, I think, for example, the stem cell models we have been generating using human stem cells, human proponent stem cells on a culture dish. And this human embryo models might be useful for studying questions like chimera, right? Human monkey chimerism and uh, without involving intact monkey embryos, which is, uh, I think, this particular method is, is, is ethically very challenging to convince people this is a viable, uh, this is a useful way to conduct research. Um, I should also comment the fact that I think uh, uh, people uh, are talking about, do we, uh, Yingsu mentioned that, what if scientists have been able to generate a synthetic embryo model that somehow have all the embryonic and extra embryonic lineages? And so at that point, likely, I think those models will be considered equivalent to human embryo. And at that point, whether 14-day rule should be applied. But going back, in fact, I want to step back. I think scientists like us, many scientists working in this area, and we're hoping building models to ask fundamental questions about human development, advancing understanding about human development. We know much better mouse development, chicken development, right, uh, like animal development than human development. Um, but a lot, of most, a lot of important fundamental questions about human development, they don't necessarily require us to establish complete human embryo models to study them. So which means that, in fact, scientists, we can come up with different models, and they are lacking certain cell types, right? They are incomplete models, and still allow us to probe those fundamental questions without, without the possibility of bypassing the, the limit. I think that's going to be a viable, a really a promising, direct, uh, I guess, approach to push this field forward. Yeah, just to give you a little preview of what's coming in the next two uh, presentations for the series, so brain organoids and multicellular engineered living systems. So you're going to see in those talks, uh, I didn't want to give it out too much in this talk, but, but uh, I think there's a general guiding principle. What's the minimal 
level of complexity you need to answer your very important research question and just leave it at that. Don't add any unnecessary, unnecessary scientifically unnecessary com completeness to your model because that will just raise further ambiguities morally. Um, so same thing for the brain organoid models. Like what are you trying to answer? So getting back to the human cells and to the monkey embryos, people might say, well, why are they doing that? Um, there's been great difficulty getting human cells to survive in a pig or sheep embryo to get transformable human organs. Some of you have heard about that kind of work. They want to get transformable human organs by knocking out the ability of the animal to make the organ and then rescuing that ability with human cells, and then you get 100% human organ. Um, they can't get the cells to survive in those animal systems because evolutionarily, pig and sh sheep are just too far away. So they said, we need to learn more about how to make the human cells more competitive in a different host environment. So that's why they're using the monkey embryos. They're not, to answer that question, you don't have to gestate it. You, don't, you have to see them in culture and see how, what stage of pluripotency, because the different stages of pluripotency do you put into the animal host, what stage of the host do you do to get the cell survival to happen, to then make an incremental step to then maybe going further and further out away from human beings with your species, then to get to the large animals. So people confuse this. They think, oh, they're going to grow human organs and monkeys. That's terrible because you're going to kill the monkeys. No, there's no gestation. It's just to study cell cell competition of the species and then later for all the people who eat bacon and you know lamb chops and stuff you know they're going to use those animals to grow organs for transplantation so that's why i thought it was interesting to ask the question if that's what you're, all you're trying to do in the system is use a monkey embryo to see how the cells can survive in that foreign system would it be informative if you put chimp ips cells because that's even closer to man than the rhesus monkey ips cells that they're using or the host embryos that they're using for the others uh, experiments in a very controlled system to see what it takes to get the human cells to predominate over the monkey or the chimp iPS cells in that controlled environment. So you have to always ask, why are they doing this? What's the minimum required to answer that question or to interrogate that question? And let's at least start with that as a general principle, just because you just really don't need to go down the road of all the other things that get stirred up when they say, oh, this team is putting human cells into monkey embryos. Well, what do you think? People are going to then jump to, oh, then what's going to happen to the animal after it's born? Well, no, it's not going to be born, right? Um, so that's going to be the principle that's going to come up then in the next two talks, because the brain organized kind of trigger these questions of how far are you going to go. That's kind of answerable by, well, what is it you want to study? Same thing with the engineer systems, these weird, ambiguous, semi-living systems that they're making over in Cambridge, OK? Um, yeah, I don't know if you want to So I just want to thank you both. Dr. Fu, this is enormously informative and interesting, and we very much appreciate your coming to talk to us about it. For those of you who are accustomed to coming to this seminar on the first Thursdays, remember that the brain organoid one is out of sequence a little, so it's on March 19th. Um, and join, please join me in thanking them both for it.